Welcome to the Prospective Doctor Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Pre-med and medical students alike are encouraged to tune in each week for tips on how to become a strong med school candidate, gain acceptance into the school of your dreams, and succeed on your journey toward residency and becoming a doctor. Welcome to a bonus episode of the Perspective Doctor podcast. My name is Sam Smith. I'm the host of the MCAT Basics podcast and today's guest host. I'm joined by Chase DeMarco. He is a medical student and hosts two podcasts himself, Medical Nemonist and the One Minute Perceptor podcast. Uh, Last time Chase was on the podcast, we talked quite a bit about the Medical Nemonist podcast. Today it's going to be flipped. We're going to talk about the One Minute Perceptor podcast. So first off, Chase, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me back. We had a lot of fun last time, so hopefully we can give some really great advice to the audience this time as well. Yeah. So you on your podcast, you talk to so many different doctors, and um, especially on the One Minute Preceptor podcast, you talk about tips for clinical rotations, talk a little bit about study habits. Um, How many doctors do you think you have talked to on both your podcasts combined? Has it been in the 50s, 100s? Oh, that's a good one. Let's see. We're in season three of the One Minute Preceptor podcast. Each season has about uh, 15, 16 episodes. Um, Already recorded all of them, even though they're not released yet for season three there. And also a couple dozen other ones in the Medical Nemesis podcast. Obviously in that, we're focusing more on study tips and tackling the boards and memorizing uh, material for school. But altogether, yeah, it's got to be over 60, I would think. Wow. So a lot. Um, And so what I kind of want to do here is just really pick your brain about some of the things that you've learned about clinical rotations and pass that information then on to the listeners. Um, And and so with that said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you some of these questions and then play the audio from your podcast. And that way we can hear uh, from the experts ourselves. Yeah, that sounds interesting. I'm not entirely sure how this is going to work out, but I'll try to recall as best I can uh, some of the main concepts, and then we can listen from the experts directly. Sounds good. So let's just kind of frame this conversation. Um, For pre-meds that might not be familiar with clinical rotations, uh, what what do those look like? And maybe put that in the context of all four years of of medical school. Sure. So From the pre-med standpoint, probably the closest would be shadowing experience, which a lot of students need to get in order to apply for medical school, or at least it looks good on your resume, your CV. So it's when you're following a physician around in the clinical setting, seeing patients, generally speaking, and getting familiarized with how the hospital life works, with how patient care works, with how the interactions between staff works. And in medical school, we kind of have it, generally speaking, as the preclinical years, which are the first two years. It's mostly lecture-based. You're in the lecture hall, listening to professors give their PowerPoint presentations, taking your exams. And then the second two years, traditionally, have been the clinical years. And that's when you're in the hospital with your preceptor, switching out into all the different specialties to see what you like, what you don't like. And also, it's a great opportunity to network with other students and physicians that might be able to help you find a good spot later on in your residency and maybe even find the residency spot in a particular location that you're looking for. So is there anything that you can do in those first two preclinical years to prepare for these rotations? There definitely is. And it's something I didn't really do because when you first get into med school, it's so busy. You have so many things to study and learn. You're in the classroom for six, seven, eight hours, depending on if there's also uh, bonus study groups afterwards. Then you go home and you're studying constantly and you're not really thinking that far ahead. You're just trying to keep your head above floating right now. Um, And there are some things that students can be aware of. And obviously that is going to be First off, maybe the specialties that you might be interested in or know you are not interested in based on previous experience. Um, There are different things that you can plan for as far as how you're going to tackle studying while you're in the clinical setting, because you're still going to have your board exams potentially at that point in time. A lot of schools require you to take shelf exams, which are specific to each specialty, Uh, internal medicine shelf, family medicine shelf, psychiatry shelf exam. Um, Having the different resources available to you, whether that be video, uh, audio, books, whatever, and what devices you can use in the hospital setting can really help you start to prepare for at least the learning aspect of it. And there are a lot of other skills that are discussed on the One Minute Preceptor podcast that can be developed ahead of time. 
But before we get into all that, I want to hear from Dr. Jason Mazel, who is a surgeon and a clerkship director, and he talks about what rotations in the third and fourth year of medical school look like. The way I'll, my clinic will be set up is I'll have the students go in and see the patient first, then they'll come out, they present to me, and then I'll say, all right, what do you think this is? And so just really just put them on the spot rather than them just being a, a recall to me. I want them just to think through it. And so they'll you know give me maybe two or three things on the differential. I'll say, all right, well, what do you want to do about it? I mean, you know what you think it is now. So it's, if I was not sitting here, what would you do? What test would you order? How would you work this patient up? And, and so really putting them in the driver's seat. And then when they maybe are correct, then I'll say, great, that's excellent. And then here's a couple more facts or if they're off base, and I say, well, I, I'm not thinking this because of this. Now, what's your differential and what is your number one uh, now? And so it really is just kind of standing right outside the patient's room and saying, all right, let's act like I'm not here. What are you going to do? What's your diagnosis? And, and, and just making them take the role of a physician, even potentially even very early on. Um, and so then that will just be re repeated over and over. And so I think when that expectation is set, when you go in and see the patient, as soon as you walk out, then you begin to then more intuitively start thinking through a differential. Like, okay, what really is this? Rather than just going and relying on the attending or the resident to tell you what it is. And it seems like a lot of preceptors basically follow this model without actually knowing that they're following this model. So what you just said, you ask them for a commitment by asking them what their diagnosis is. Then you probe for supporting evidence. They're giving a couple options and explaining why they chose those options. You're reinforcing what was done properly by giving them compliments and a few more resources to look more in depth. And so we're, everyone is kind of following this model, but I like to break it down for students that might not be able to notice that there's this stepwise process to follow and to really make sure you're not missing a step. I think it's good for the students to know this model is out there too. So that when they have a attending that is not following it, then they can try to probe the attending to, you know, to start doing and asking them questions a little bit more. That was an interesting clip. So uh, kind of another question I have here is what are the importance of these two years of um, ro rotations? Like, are you getting letters of recommendation? What role do they play in preparing you for residency? Yes, obviously it is important for the actual patient care aspect and gaining that experience, going to see different patients with seeing these different diseases, different procedures. Um, but also it works to your benefit to work on what you're going to use for your materials for residency applications. So a big part of that is going to be your letters of recommendation. You want certain types of letters of recommendation from certain types of staff. Some are going to be ranked higher than others at certain hospitals when you're applying for your residency. So one thing that you do want to ask for from your preceptors is first, initially let them know that you are looking for a potential letter from them so they're aware and ask what you can do to prepare for that. And you also want to make sure you're getting a strong letter because a lot of preceptors might write you a letter, but it's not going to reflect uh, very positively on you. It's just kind of generic and it's not going to help. So Dr. Bruce Morgenstern has some really great advice for how to ask for a strong letter of recommendation. If a student wanted a letter of recommendation from you, are there any particular things they should do or say to inquire about that? No, they just need to ask. The rule about the rules about letters of recommendations is that, you know, the question should be, would you be willing to write a positive letter or a strong letter of recommendation for me is really the way the question should be phrased, because I might write a letter of recommendation, but it might not be strong. And that's not necessarily a good thing. The other the other thing about you know, having been a medical educator now for close to 30 years, there, there is sadly an unwritten code in letters of recommendation that not all preceptors actually know the code. And so they, the, a preceptor might happily agree to write you a strong letter of recommendation, and then they may inadvertently not. Again, it's a matter of trying to do good faculty development to, for the preceptors so they understand what that, that unwritten code is. Wow, I wouldn't have even thought about that. But yeah, depending on what your experiences are in something like that, you could think that you're writing a really strong letter and it's subpar. <laughs> We've reached this interesting world where there's been a, an inflation in superlatives. So uh, superlatives that were really strong superlatives for student performance when I was a student are now mediocre superlatives. And there are more superlative superlatives. Um, and if you don't know the right one, you can you can sort of categorize a student in a way that you think is great as the letter writer, but is actually not. It's a sad statement, but 
like there's been great inflation at the undergraduate level and great inflation in high school. When I went to high school, it was impossible to have a GPA of greater than four. But now high school students can have a 4.3 and college students, I think, can even have over four. I don't understand if the scale goes up to four, but that's been the sort of inflation that's happened. And it, you know, parallel to that, there's been an inflation in superlatives. Wow. You really have to stand out then in new and better ways every year. Exactly. So are there any other things that you can do in medical school in order to bolster your residency application, maybe outside of these clinical rotations? I definitely think there are, and a lot of these I wasn't even aware of before. I would say there are these extracurriculars, these more communal and societal aspects of a residency application that a lot of us don't think about, such as what are some of your hobbies and do you have family in the area? What are some reasons that a residency director looking at your application thinks, wow, this person's actually going to want to stay here after residency too. They're going to want to work here because that's one of their goals as well. They want to teach you, but they also would like you to stay there if you're a good match. So if you have more connections to that location, whether it be societal, whether it be uh, events that you like to do, if you like snowboarding, you might want to go to one place. If you like surfing, you might you know be a better fit for another state. So there are a lot of topics there that I had not really thought about. And really, I'd say the interview with Brenda Thompson was really informative on this uh, GME pundit, as she is called. So let's listen to a few of her tips. Of course, there's a couple of things that I think medical students should automatically know that it's a big deal. The personal statement is a big deal. The personal statement is really what says how you got into residency, what got you into medicine, who are you? This is the only opportunity you have to really express who you are. Tell us a little bit about yourself so we can see your personality through this personal statement. So that's a big component. And that's the one thing that they can control. So I always recommend, you know, if you need to get somebody to edit it, if you need to get help pulling out your story of why you got into medicine or why you want that specialty, then do it. Because this is like the make or break for a program. Especially if you have spelling errors, there's no reason. There's no reason to have spelling errors. So one of the things that they look for is what your connection is to the area. So for example, I had worked in Denver about three years ago or so, and it was the hot spot. Everybody wanted to be in Denver, but that doesn't tell the program director why you want to be in that program. So if people are moving towards the hot spot area, that program director is going to say, well, what's the connection? Why do they want to be here? Because they're fearful that you might choose somewhere else. Most candidates will choose wherever their spouse is, or wherever their family is, or wherever their hometown is. So they want to see a connection. So as you said, you've talked to tons and tons of physicians and gotten a lot of advice about clinical rotations. If possible, would you just narrow down like your top five tips for clinical rotations and just give us kind of the meat and potatoes of what we should know and and prepare for in clinical rotations? Well, it's definitely hard to narrow down too much because there's so much we could discuss. But of course, the audience can always go and check out the podcast for these full interviews. I would say one of the places you might want to start, sort of the meat and potatoes foundation, is really to be proactive in your education, in your clinical rotations. And that is discussed a lot more with residency director Ted O'Connell. Yes. And I actually, what we do in our group, and and I've written a blog article about it, about how to really succeed on an outpatient rotation. And part of what we ask our students to do is before any given clinic session is to get on the electronic medical record, look at your preceptor schedule for that half day, you know, come in early in the morning, look at the schedule go through the patients, know the details about their background, and even down to the level of, are they due for any vaccines and any healthcare maintenance things, and take notes on all of that so that when you come in to your preceptor, you're very well prepared. There's already, I think, the beginnings of some ownership around that patient when you've done the pre-work, and you're not just kind of walking in with your preceptor or being sent in. You actually have some background about them. And Are there any particular ways that you would recommend a student prepare before they start a rotation with you or in family practice in general? Oh, absolutely. And I I think much of what I will say uh, could be extrapolated to just about any rotation, definitely outpatient rotations and probably many inpatient rotations. We want success on multiple levels, right? As a student, you want to impress your preceptors because you may 
you know, a grade may depend upon it, an evaluation may depend upon it. You may be looking for a letter of recommendation down the line. So you want to impress on those fronts. I think from that patient ownership standpoint, you just want to perform well on the rotation because you are providing care to patients. And I think we should all be shooting to provide the best care we possibly can. And so some of what I'm about to say is kind of built around success in all of those areas. One thing, whenever possible, I suggest that students do is to reach out to the rotation about a week or so in advance of the rotation. And you can either contact the the rotation coordinator if there is one or the attending, and really just to try to get some expectations from them about not just what hours will be, but what your role will be, whether they would like you to look through patient care ahead of time. And I would suggest even offering to do that, to be proactive, trying to find out which attendings or residents uh, a student might be working with, because then you can get online sometimes and learn a little bit about them. So you have some background, know where their strengths and interests are and have that ability to make a connection. You know, if somebody's in a particular niche within whatever their practice is or have a real practice interest, it gives you a chance to kind of study up on that niche a little bit so that you have something to relate to. Or, you know, if they have a particular patient population, uh, it gives you a chance to learn a little bit more in that realm so that you just come to the rotation a little bit more ready. And then I think next, you know, the next step is to get to the clinic early and do your research on the patients, just as I had outlined earlier, um, so that you really show up prepared, engaged, knowing what's going on with these patients. And if you're in that role, you you really do have the ability to potentially save your preceptor a little bit of time or effort or the ability to add to the quality of patient care. You know, if you notice that a patient's due for a pneumonia vaccine and you bring that up to your preceptor, you know, that's better patient. You know, your preceptor may not have noticed that and you did. It's a feather in your cap. It's better patient care or better quality care for the patient. Another one that you might want to focus on is uh, something that has been brought to attention a lot more lately, but wasn't really mentioned a lot in medicine, and that is sort of the racial disparities that we have all uh, been made much more aware of in recent times. And things that you can do to make that easier for others or yourself, and uh, things you might want to avoid, there are a lot of tips there that I think it's good that we cover them and are at least aware that these uh, potential issues might arise. And someone that really inspired me in this area was my interview with Dr. Nicole Washington, where she explained some of her past experiences and sort of what we can all do to make it a more um, inclusive medical environment. And we all have biases. I mean, we all do. Like all of us have biases towards some group or another. We just do. And those those implicit bias tests that you take are great because they do bring that stuff to light. But just saying, oh, okay, those are my biases without action to figure out how to balance that out or how to correct that or, you know, how to not let your biases drive your decision making, especially if you're in a place of power. We have to do more than just help people identify their biases. We have to move beyond diversity. I've heard the party analogy. I've heard the, so I'm from Louisiana and everything in my life, all my analogies are food related and related to like deep South food related. So, you know, I kind of think of it as like, you know, a crawfish bowl, right? Like I'm having a crawfish bowl. If I invite you, so if I'm having this all, you know, if there's this crawfish bowl and there's this here at my house and let's say, you know, It's all black people, right? And I'm going to invite you to my crawfish bowl. And I'm going to tell you to bring some friends and I'm going to invite you all. And then all of a sudden my crawfish bowl is diverse, right? Like it's, it's great. It's diverse. It's more than just black people there. It's diverse. And then the inclusion part comes in though. If I never talk to you, I haven't included you. If I just say, hey, I'm inviting you to this event, this function, and you get there and you diversify the crowd, that's fantastic. But if I never make any effort to include you and I never introduce you to people and I never make sure that you feel like, oh, you really wanted me here, right? Like if I'm like, hey, everybody, this is, this is Chase. This is my new friend. Hey, come over here and meet, you know, if I never talk to you, if I just go, oh, you're here. And I just go off to continuing to talk to my friends and never look your way, introduce you to anybody. Some random person might be nice enough to come up to you and go, hey, you look lost or, you know, what's going on over here? But 
if I don't do my part to really include you, you're not going to feel like I wanted you there, right? Mm-hmm. And then I say, hey, come on, sit at the table. Then I've included you. You're sitting at the table with everybody, crawfish on the table in front of you. I got to include you. And then if you even go a step further, you think about like the equity part of this. The equity part is that I actually show you how to eat the crawfish so you can actually leave full and fulfilled and feel like you've really had the whole experience. But if I don't go the extra step and I just invite you, then that doesn't get you to the end goal, which in this case is for you to be full and be content by the end of the night. Obviously, as we get into even more specialized medicine and medical education is just constantly evolving, there's so much new information. And we're finding that single physicians can't really take care of every aspect of a patient all the time. And a lot of hospitals are switching to a teamwork mind frame where you have teams of physicians going to see each patient. And I think that's really important to notice because We need to start building our teamwork skills earlier as well, whether that be pre-meds or med students. And someone that discussed a lot about teamwork was Andrew Tisser. There are a host of different things that students might not know to plan for or just might not think about as much as they probably should beforehand. And I know one of those is just utilizing certain team resources and communicating properly with the team. And I believe you have some good advice that you could share on that one. Yep, sure. So my wife says that I talk too much, all right? I'm the guy that talks to people on the plane, unfortunately. But I think involving everyone in the team into your learning is really important doing something nice for the nurses in your first week or so really goes a long way because they tell you if you make one nurse mad, that's it. You're done because it travels like wildfire. Let's, for example, nursing is you can really empower them by having them teach you things. And now nurses are much better at starting IVs than generally physicians are. I'll say it every day because they do it again and again and again. So When you have some downtime on medicine rotation or a different rotation, especially emergency medicine rotation, go grab one of the senior nurses and be like, hey, can you show me how to put in an IV? They'll be so happy. And you'll learn a skill. And then they got your back. So that's that's an important thing. Same thing with our technicians. You know, uh, where do the leads go? Putting someone on the monitor. How do you do X, Y, Z? Getting the rest of the team involved is really important. A, in your learning, because everyone can teach you something, and B, just getting support and making it a little less scary and more fun place to work and learn. Another one that stuck out to me a lot is a a leadership educator that I found and physician educator that really discusses sort of creating your, your goals, your visions, and making sure that you know what you're going for, you have a way to monitor it, whether this be personally or academically, um, just really being uh, being guided in your actions. And that can go very far in the medical setting as well. What do you plan on getting out of this rotation? What sort of interactions do you plan on having with other staff, with your preceptor? Are you going just because it's a core rotation and you're mandated to do it? Or is it an elective that you really want to learn more about? So just sort of having these goal setting uh, tools can be very useful. And for that, Dr. Elsie Coe really elaborated on some of the tools and mindsets that she thinks is very useful in this academic environment. What do you think is a particular struggle that a new student would find going into this? Something that maybe they haven't run into before or just a common obstacle? The most common obstacle that comes right to mind, your own self. (laughs) I mean, literally, I think majority of people may not be happy with their jobs, not happy with some aspect of their life, with their time and money freedom. They might have a lot of doubt. It's a matter of really developing. And I wish somebody told me this when I was a medical student because I didn't know this. There is so much more out there now in personal development and books. And like Jim Carrey, if you Google him, he's a famous actor and your generation might not know him, but he was in Dumb and Dumber and all these like really funny movies back in the day. He was a starving artist. He was not famous at all when he first started out. And he went to the self-help section in the bookstore. You don't have to do that anymore. You could order on Amazon or, you know, Barnes & Noble, whatever bookstore. And he would start reading books. There's so many books like Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. You could just find a myriad of books. And I'm sure like Chase, you're probably 
a great resource for them. But if you start studying and developing yourself, because you're the one who's probably limiting yourself the most, and you start getting bold and being the person that you want to be, he wrote this check to himself. Watch the YouTube video. He wrote a check for $10 million and he put it in his wallet. And he would drive to Hollywood at the top of this hill and he would visualize every single day he's going to get $10 million for his first gig, that in three years, he's going to be paid $10 million. And he would start feeling, you know, really great. He would start feeling confident about, you know, his abilities. And he goes, you know what? I don't have it yet, but it's here. And the check would just like slowly, like, you know, become frayed and <laughs> it's like falling apart. But in three years, he signed a contract for Dumb and Dumber, the first movie that he was in. For $10 million. So I'm not saying go out there and think, oh, I'm going to make $10 million. I'm just saying pick a dream. Pick a dream that you want. Find out what it is that you're good at. There's so many tools online too to figure out what that is your strength finders and there's personality tests to talk to people. Go figure it out. Go look and see what else is out there. And you'll be amazed. You could start making phone calls, you could start doing research. And then you're going to find a way to get into the field that you want to be. Because you don't want to be stuck in some residency that you're going to be like, oh my God, I wasted four or five years of my life. And then switch. Because I have friends who did that. They switched from, you know, primary care to anesthesia. And then you're going to spend another, like, what, four or five years? You're going to be in training for another 10 years. You need to have a bigger picture instead of just being the working ant, looking down at the ground and doing your job. And as you get along, you go along your way. You need to be like the eagle in the sky, looking down at what am I doing? Where am I going? Who am I? And work from that vision as if, almost as if it's already happened to you. Like, I'm going to say, you know, if I'm a medical student and I'm like, wow, I really love interventional radiology. I love the technology. I love the personality of the people who it attracts because we're really different from vascular surgeons who do the same procedures or cardiologists. I'm biased, I know. You visualize, you know, you do your rotation, you really love it. You visualize yourself being in a very successful practice and you write it down, write it down. Like if you write it down, you're twice as likely to happen. That's what studies show. So write it down and read that every day. With that in the forefront of your mind, you're going to take steps that you wouldn't have otherwise. I think that is great advice and maybe keeping some sort of journal of not only your end goals, but some of the steps that maybe you're making and show those little small successes along the way that help to keep you motivated, especially for long periods of time when you have these really large goals, sometimes just waiting for that goal. So one of my mentors, Bob Proctor, look him up on YouTube. He's phenomenal. He's going to be 86, I think, pretty soon, or maybe he just turned 86. He basically says there's three types of goals. Okay, there's an A-type goal, it's like your everyday to-do list. A B-type goal is something that you really would love to have, but it wouldn't take that much work for you to get it. Say you had a Jeep, and it's a 1998 Jeep, but you really want to have the 2020 Jeep. So it's just going to be a little bit harder because you're going to have to work at it to get the money and the finances, whatever. It's just like something similar, but it's just, you know, it's not a dream goal. A C-type goal is something that is a dream goal, something you've never done before, something that would get you really excited, that really resonates with your core values and wouldn't hurt anybody. That's what you need to have on your goal card. And then every day, what you should do, if you're going to talk about journaling, is not only read or write that goal down, but then write three small action steps that I'm going to take today to work towards my goal. And it might be the type A goal, right? Because you're doing your to-do list. Or it could be a B-type goal because this is how I'm going to get there. You know, how am I going to get from New York to Los Angeles? I, I need to get to Chicago first. And I'm going to get to Denver. And then I'm going to get to Los Angeles. So that's how it works. All successful people do that unconsciously or not. That's how they do it. They think about what they want. They have a vision. You need to have a vision. And then probably the last one is, I've got to say best for last, Dr. Jack Endy. He actually wrote one of the really popular textbooks on teaching medical education. And 
he really incorporates a lot of the information he discusses into focusing on patient care. Because in the end, isn't that what we're there for? We need to focus on the patient. We need to make sure that we're suiting their needs, not just, you know, treating the illness, uh, treating the disease as has been typical for many decades in medicine, but really I hate using the term holistic, but <laughs> listening to the patient, seeing what their other concerns might be, seeing if there's anything non-medical we can do to help out too, and just really focusing on the patient in the end. What are some of the ways that maybe a student can better prepare for these scenarios and become better learners? Well, um, it's a partnership between the students and the teachers. I think the students need to appreciate that the world has changed for them and that they're no longer out there just to pass examinations and to earn grades, but they have taken a big step. And guess what? The most important entity in this whole enterprise is the patient. And students need to really go in there with the attitude that I'm here not to impress my attending, but I'm here to be a benefit to my patient. I'm also here to learn so that I could be of benefit to future patients, including a time when I'll be working independently. So they really have to change their focus from getting that uh, examination grade to being as helpful as they can in the uh, clinical arena while learning as much as they can. The attendings have a real responsibility here. That is the preceptors, the teachers, preceptors for outpatient, attendings for inpatient. And their responsibility really should center around orientation. Yes, it is unstructured, but it's not entirely free form. There are specific expectations that faculty have for the students, and those need to be made explicit. You can't just assume that because you're thinking of what a student should do, the student is thinking the same thing. You owe it to the student to sit down at the very beginning and have a real in-depth orientation with specifics. I'd like my presentations done this way. I would like you to do the uh, write-ups that way. I'd like you to interact with the team and still another way. Here's what I'm hoping you'll get out of this rotation. And that orientation really can be very important in setting the tone for how we're going to interact. There'll be a lot of feedback. I'm going to be uh, as critical as I should be to make sure that you're doing things right. Please, please, let's get past the grades and the evaluation. Let's join together and work on how we can make you the best doctor you could be. Well, Chase, I really appreciate you coming on today. Um, I, I think this was super informative, and I really hope that the listeners find it as useful and as interesting as I did. Yeah, it's been great coming on. And, you know, if anyone wants to find out more about me, pretty much everywhere, all social media at Chase DeMarco. And also if students, whether it be pre-med or medical students looking for shadowing experience or uh, clinical rotations, we actually have a platform that's opening up pretty soon, hopefully by the time this podcast airs called Find a Rotation. So you might want to go check out findarotation.com. At Med School Coach, we know that getting into medical school is hard. In fact, 60% of pre-meds who apply to medical school don't even get accepted. And if you want to get accepted into a top medical school, it's even harder. It's a complicated process, and even students with great grades and MCAT scores get left out. That's why more students than ever are turning to Med School Coach for admissions advising. Our advisors are all physicians and former admissions committee members, so they know exactly what medical schools are looking for. One-on-one -on -one admissions advising from Med School Coach makes all the difference. Our expert team will help you develop a game plan, prepare your application, edit your essays, and coach you for interviews. Every pre-med has a story, and we'll help you tell it so you can stand out from the crowd. Visit us online at medschoolcoach.com and use offer code PODCAST10 to save 10%, up to $400 on a Med School Coach admissions advising package. You can achieve your medical school dreams, and Med School Coach can help. Each episode of the Perspective Doctor podcast is brought to you by Med School Coach. To access articles, videos, webinars, and free tools to help you succeed on your journey toward med school and beyond, visit our website, perspectivedoctor.com. 
We hope you tune in again next time.